Hi guys, I'm Paulo Batelli and this is edition 12 of the THA podcast, brought to you by Theo Humanist Arts. As usual, it's great to be back where our goal is to bring you weekly shows and all the best interviews we can get our hands on. Our talks include news, conspiracies, spirituality, the occult, science, history, art, philosophy, religion and much more. If you'd like to get hold of us and send us any ideas for the show or requests for potential guests, you can do so by emailing info at thapodcast.com. That's info at thapodcast.com. Okay, well, today's guest is Tracy R. Twyman, and Tracy is a prolific scholar on esoteric history. She's written 12 books, including the popular titles Money Grows on the Tree of Knowledge and the Merovingian Mythos. She's also appeared on TV documentaries Bloodline and Jesse Ventura's Conspiracy Theory. So if you're interested in bloodlines tracing back to ancient times and the origins of money and the dollar, then you might want to stick about. But before we do that, I'd just like to send another thank you out to Shoni Owens for her continued support. It's really appreciated helping us out with lots of guests on the show, recommendations and so on. I have asked her to come on the show, but I don't I don't think that's going to happen. But um, thank you anyway. And also thank you to all the people downloading the show. It's nice to see people listening. Um, if you do enjoy the show, please link it, tell your friends about it because it does help us. We don't have any funding to promote the show, so we do rely on you guys to spread the word for us. So, without any further ado, I think it's time for a surge from the dramaturge, David Parry. Mr. Obertelli, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. How are, you, how are we today? Um, I am okay because I got the money, I got the place. The podcast has the figure, it's got the face. We need to get together uh, over a glass of champagne and talk to our amazing guest. Are you um did you, did you just say you're in you've got you're in the money then? Um I'm never in the money, I'm in theatre. You... I would love to be in the money. If you, yeah. if you have, I think you should give lots to me, I think. If I had just some that, money just out the ca- kindness of your heart. I have a kindness. If I had lots of money, I would give it to you. I can't confess I have any at the minute, which is worrying me a bit. Mm, yeah, is, is it, ten, it does tend to create worries, that, doesn't it? That's showbiz, but I've had a bit too much showbiz in recent months, and I need some, some practical results. Well, our, our guest has um, got some interesting research on money and uh, where the dollar came from, so that might, be, uh, that might help, maybe. The secrets of the universe and the monetary system revealed, I can barely wait. Yeah, well, the the thing about research, like esoteric history and stuff, there's so much to go into. So, um, we'll just have to sort of, when we get her on, just um, indulge in wherever it takes us, really, because there's so much in there, isn't it? A free flow of inquiry. You can't beat it. Well, let's get to it. Hello, Tracy. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. That's no no problem. Uh, I've been checking out some of your work on YouTube and find uh, the research that you've done on Money Grows on the Tree of Knowledge, your book, um, which was very interesting. Um, maybe we could start by going into uh, um, what inspired you with that book. Sure. Well, um, really, it was a follow-up, actually, to a previous book that came out, I think, in 2005, which was Solomon's Treasure. So I've been talking about what I would say is like the esoteric history and meaning of money and monetary systems for, you know, since 2005. Um, and how that all got started, I don't know. I mean, I really was just like um, a couple things. One, wondering about it myself. Just, uh, you know, money was something that's on my mind like it is on so many people, I would imagine. And I was just wondering, you know, throughout my uh, writing history, uh, I've always been like, looking for the hidden angle on things. You know, that's what yeah. I do. I go basically from one topic to another as my research takes me. I've spent many years studying the occult, you know, from the perspective kind of of an occultist or someone who takes it seriously, you know, not just a skeptic. Yeah. And so, you know, when I came to this topic, I thought, well, what, what uh, really is the occult aspect of money? And back then, I, I really not very many people had written about that at all. Um, and one day I was looking at the $1 bill and, you know, like so many people I've, I was familiar with 
Masonic conspiracy theories about how there's Masonic symbols on it, which there are. Mm. But I saw all of a sudden a different layer of meaning to it where I, I thought, well, it's telling you something. And it's not just about the New World Order, which is what so many people think. It's more, it's more about, I thought at the time, alchemy. It, um, and basically what, I, I, what struck me at that moment as I was looking at the $1 bill is that this entire thing has been constructed to sell you on the idea that this this one dollar bill is money, and in fact that it's gold. You know that mm, it's like yeah. it's it's in, it should be used in place of gold. And uh, you know I started looking at just the symbolism of the the bill. One thing that struck me was that it was green, and you know which I, I would associate with fertility. And uh, come to find out, sure enough, that's what it actually says on the the. Um, website of the u.s treasury the that's the reason why the money is green yeah. um and then and then i uh started decoding symbols on the one dollar bill and also just thinking about what how the monetary system itself works that it that it you know the 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 dollar is a part of um and re and realizing that you know they they are um, they're doing what you know what is called ma uh, making fiat currency right they're ma they're making money out of of nothing basically they're printing something and saying that it has a certain value and basically because of the faith that we put in the government that backs that dollar that's the reason why uh, you know it it does have a spendable value just like gold used to and um, at any rate, just to sort of, I guess, give a shorter answer so that you can ask another question. Right, right. Um, I would just basically say, like, uh, I, I discovered in the course of my research that, you know, my hunch was true that actually the people who have been involved in um, constructing, I guess, coming up with the philosophical bases for uh, the different different economic systems, monetary systems that have we've had throughout history – uh, so many of them were actually occultists and specifically interested in alchemy. Mm. Uh, um, actually, Isaac Newton is one of them. Uh, he was a comptroller of the currency at, uh, for a while and uh, had all sorts of ideas about money and also about alchemy. Um, the, uh, another fellow named uh, Georgius Agricola is actually the father of mineralogy, they call him. You know, was yeah. the first person to write a book about minerals and and, and metallurgy, right. and also was uh, the basically was the the person there in charge of the place where the first silver dollars came out of in Bohemia, and uh, it was like the you know the beginning of this um, revolution of uh, of money at the time yeah. uh, that yeah. uh, that should change the world. So, at any rate, um, you know, I, I wrote Solomon's Treasure about that, and then uh, later on developed the ideas a little bit more as I looked further into the, the alchemy of uh, the modern monetary system. So I've uh, been doing that for a while. <laughs> and, sure. uh, and I think that I've come up with some interesting ideas. I think. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, I mean, tying it all to alchemy, um, what, who would you think, I mean, who, who started alchemy? What, where did, where did it all come from? Can you, can you trace any roots back to before alchemy and what these, what these guys, what their agenda was from the very start? Well, you know, alchemy um, is kind of a broad term, and I would almost say that really you could think of all magic, which is, you know, the actual, you know, manipulating reality somehow magically through supernatural forces. I would say that that all kind of falls under the category of uh, alchemy, because it's basically it's the, it's the art or the science of transforming things. So, you know, the classic thing is from lead into gold. Yeah. And when it comes to uh, economics, um, obviously that's something that's happening in the modern economy. It wasn't always like that, uh, you know. In in that, you know, it used to be much more common for obviously coins to have intrinsic value to them. Uh, so it wasn't as much of a mind trick, basically, the, the currency that was floating around at the time. Uh, and I and what occurred to me, you know, when this idea first came to me about the dollar bill is that the the $1 bill was redesigned in the 30s. Mm. Uh, and this was a time, it was right around the same time that the uh, money was actually being removed from the gold standard. And, uh, you know, the, the depression was happening. The uh, stock market had crashed a few years earlier. 
um, they were restructuring the entire sort of legal and economic basis of the United States in a way. One of the things that happened then when they were um, making, taking the money off of the gold standard, one of the things they were doing, uh, they made it illegal to own gold at the time. They were, ta they were, taking, they were taking people's gold away from them and giving them uh, paper in exchange. It was, it was actually illegal to own gold, was it? Yes. Yeah? Oh, and well. because they wanted, they needed to have the gold to uh, loan it out, basically, to put it up as collateral to get to get more loans. Mm, yeah. Um, because they were the what happened around that time was the the government actually went bankrupt totally, mm. and you know they had they had to go hat in hand to international financiers to to refinance the whole government. And one of the things I think is little understood, and e even you know, I'm not saying I myself understand it. Very few people even know this happened. But basically, mm -hmm. one of the things that happened is that the property in the United States, including the land beneath our feet, everything, mm -hmm. everything that anyone owns, was hypothecated right. to the, uh, the financiers of the government. The government actually acted like they own this stuff, and the, in and in Congress, they passed you know statements declaring that uh, they were basically putting this up for uh, collateral yeah. uh, to get more loans. And so all this kind of weird stuff was happening at this time. The American public had no idea really what was going on. Uh, but what was happening was the basis of their money was changing. The, and, the, and, of course, they were being robbed of their um, property, really. Uh, but in order to make them feel like they still had something, you know, like, oh, we're giving you something of equal value. Uh, they had to redesign the money, I think, and 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 represent it to the public. Mm. Mm. You know, to, uh, to make them feel like you know this is something real. So uh, that's when they put these seals on the back of the dollar. So what you see there uh, with the pyramid, and also then the eagle. On, on, there's these two roundels as they're called these two circles one on either side one has the pyramid with the eye in it and then the other has the eagle um those are the t front back sides of the uh, uh the great seal of the united states as it's called and this thing had been sitting around um you know not being used for much of anything except its, its purpose was literally just to uh seal treaties like international agreements so and they made metal dies for this thing when they first created it. It was right around, you know, 1776 times, mm -hmm. uh, right around the beginning. And uh, they made a metal die for it, but they never even made uh, the backside of the seal. They never actually made a, a die for that uh, because they never used it. They only used the front, which was the eagle. So the backside, which is the mysterious thing, it has the, the pyramid with the eye and everyone thinks it's Masonic and it's about the New World Order. Uh, no one really had seen that much mm. until the 30s when they put this thing on the back of the dollar bill. And in fact, it was the president's choice specifically to switch the order of it because it used to be, you know, that the like going from left to right, like you would read, they had the front of the seal, which is the eagle, on the left, it, followed by the uh, the back of it on the right. And the president decided, you know, this back of the seal with the pair of it is so much more interesting. Uh, we want to put that on the left and said to, to uh, draw attention to that. So, so you and don't, so, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say you don't you you don't think that that pyramid is free Freemasonic. I'm not saying it isn't. Right. Okay. I'm saying there, there's just uh, there's more than just you know them saying hey we're the Freemasons look at us yeah yeah okay. it's uh it's a it was specifically actually see the people who chose to uh, redesign it the way they did it was a, a group of three Freemasons. Mm. They all went to the same lodge there uh, in D.C., actually. And so it was the president, Roosevelt, and the secretary of agriculture and the secretary of the treasury. And they all got together and uh, talked about how they wanted to do this and what kind of message they wanted to send with it. And the idea of putting the seal on the back at all uh, was... Um, I believe it was Morgenthau's idea. I think that he was the um, uh, Secretary of Agriculture. But, but he was flipping through these books at the lodge in the library. 
And uh, one of them was this uh, book by Manly P. Hall, who's a, a Freemason and a um, occult writer. And it was about the Great Seal of the United States. So there was a, a chapter in it about that. And, uh, you know, and, and talking about mystical symbolism in it and how it's this, this that the back side of the seal with the pyramid was never used much in public, it says, because it was considered the emblem of a secret society and not proper to be used in public. So they were kind of shy about it, actually, they, because it was so Masonic. But, uh, but when this fellow was looking at the, this book and, and saw this seal in there and the story of how it, you know, it was this important Masonic symbol – uh, how in the pyramid is supposed to like represent the you know the new Atlantis rising basically the the the, uh, uh, the idea of that you can have this sort of perfect utopian society that you know that that's what they wanted the United States to be and that it would be this beacon to the rest of the world and everyone would look to us to, to when they want to emulate us and all this right. so yeah. uh, these are the kind of ideas that they had in their mind when they decided to put this thing on the back. Um, and then as far as you notice how it says um, the the word one or the number one all over the dollar bill. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I consider the dollar bill to like represent the whole monetary, the whole dollar itself. You know, the, all the all the other dollar bills are, you know, n not as important as the one dollar bill because it kind of represents the whole system here. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, but the reason but I, I they actually put that in there 13 times and the number 13 is all over. The dollar bill, of course, and that's considered to be somehow uh, connected to, you know, to the, the birth of the United States and the fact that there were 13 colonies originally, 13 stars on the flag and everything. But I think there's another layer to it, which is that 13 is a magical number. It's always been um, sort of associated, on the one hand, at least in the Western occult um, tradition, kind of with the dark side of things. Also, uh, it goes back to the Templars. They used to uh, use the number 13 sometimes in conjunction with the, uh, the skull and crossbones symbol. Um, and also, uh, according to my research at least, it's, um, uh, in some traditions it's connected to, the, to alchemy and the alchemical process. There's this idea that there's 13 steps in the alchemical process. And, uh, and then the skull and crossbones symbol that I was just describing that the Templars use – and, uh, and they connect to the number 13. Um, that also is used in alchemy. It's, it represents the, uh, the uh, primo materia or the basic raw material that you use that you transform in alchemy. Mm. So basically, I think there, that just the use of the number 13 on, on the dollar bill is perhaps a reference to alchemy. And then this emphasis on one, the, the number one, the word one, and then the, uh, also the Latin word unum. Uh, they're trying to emphasize this idea of, you know, that we're all together. We're all part of something, yeah. uh, as, uh, you know, as Americans. And specifically, not just Am Americans themselves, but anyone who uses the dollar. It's the idea that by using the dollar and transacting commerce, you're putting your faith into it. You're becoming one with this system, and uh, and basically, I think you know they needed to to uh, promote ideas like this because it, you know it, what was going on economically at the time with basically um, people's real property being taken away from them and, and, and them uh, being given a whole you know a system based on ideas instead of of uh, physical reality. Uh, it was so hard to sell to them that you really had to use magic. I think you had to use like hypnotism and uh, and uh, symbolism to try to sell it to them. So yeah. I, that's kind of what I would think was going on. Right, right. Um, going back to um, the Francis Bacon thing with with the utopian new world and the great new world, and um, when you when you spoke about Atlantis, you 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 um, basically, I mean, thinking of Atlantis, when you normally think about Atlantis, you think of some harmonious, beautiful place. And yet, a lot of the associations with when it's in the, in the context of what we're talking about now, it could be it could be viewed as negative. Do you think that the the, the new world order, in commas, of what people fear and talk about today, um, do you think that it's it's the same thing as what people like Francis Bacon were were sort of fantasizing about back then, or is it being distorted and, and corrupted? What, what are your general views on that? 
You know, yeah, I think that basically it's it's different depending on the person that you're talking to who's promoting the idea or participating in it somehow. So, you know, you look at the world today and it's really hard to say that this is the product of a utopian fantasy or, you know, they must have had a sick type of fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't know. When I read New Atlantis, it doesn't sound to me like Sir Francis Bacon is uh, fantasizing about, you know, a world controlled by corporations uh, or, um, you know, where everyone's a slave. Um, in, in the opposite, he's, t he's talking about uh, what, wouldn't it be great if we fixed all the problems in society, basically, somehow, so that everyone could uh, have have free time to think and uh, come up with new ideas, and you know, it'd be this world of of uh, philosophers lazing about and 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 talking with each other and writing books and stuff, and and so I think uh, you know, it's just basically he's describing the world that uh, he would like to see. And there, uh, there was this understanding at the time that there's this new world out there that's untouched. You know, of course, there were Indians living there, but I mean, they were thinking hey, they don't have governments there yet. They don't have kings and queens. They don't have economic systems. Uh, and so we could start over there from scratch and build, you know, the, the perfect place. And I think there was a little bit of arrogance there, you know, in that I think secret societies have always – including Freemasonry, a lot of times consisted of people who think they know better than, you know, they think they know what's best for everyone else. And it com comes out of the fact that, you know, it was an impressive society, I think, when, when they started it. You know, and you may be, uh, you're in a world where, you know, the, the government can, it can uh, oppress you, you know, and the, the church is oppressive. Yeah. And uh, and then you're surrounded, you know, otherwise by ignorant peasants or, you know, <laughs> um, basically yeah. uh, um, people that you you may be. I think the, the free, Freemason, the average Freemason in the beginning was, you know, someone who was like educated, um, but but a free thinker. So they were kind of dangerous to the establishment, but they also wanted to get together with other educated people, get away from the rabble and also get away from uh, the the threats of of the religious and political establishment at the time, and so they're getting together and and uh, a lot of times over a beer maybe talking about what kind of uh, society they would like to live in, and of course they're mystically minded, um, they're infused with all of these ancient traditions that they learn at the lodge, so they start thinking about you know these fantasies of what of you know, maybe there was a perfect society in the past and maybe we could somehow recreate it using these uh, um, sacred principles that we learn at the lodge. So, uh, you know, I think that maybe they um, there's a little bit of arrogance there and uh, elitism, I guess. But I don't think like Sir Francis Bacon, for instance, necessarily had uh, negative intentions when he wrote that book. And I don't really think that the, most of the people involved in the creation of the United States had negative intentions in the beginning. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I think it's turned into something totally different over time. Um, and I think yeah. that, uh, there, but there has been, you know, influence from secret societies and occultists in that so much of the time, the influ influential people in society come from those circles. They're influenced by them in one way or another. So, you know, I, I guess that could explain why you find uh, alchemical symbolism even in, uh, you know, in products of, of modern governments that seem to be seem to be acting sort of tyrannical, I guess. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not like um, I think magic has always been kind of amoral, you know, <laughs> it's a yeah. power that you can use for good or evil. So. Uh, you're going to find people using it uh, who yeah. have all kinds of motivations. The Siths or the Jedi's, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, in, also, some other stuff I've heard you you go into was the pillars. Um, was it the pillars of Hercules? Is that is that what it was? You're talking about the pillars and stuff, and I've I've heard that as well in in different sort of occult writings where you've got like Israel Israeli Regardi and writing about the middle pillar, and then you've got the the, the 
the nine nine eleven, the twin towers, and there seems to be a lot of symbology with the twin towers. Um, what what are your views on that symbology? Like, because um, there's a, a lot of that about. Well, certainly, yeah. I mean, the use of two pillars on the outside of a temple, mm. and references to two pillars being used in a temple. Supposedly, it's very ancient. Like. You know, we've been talking about Atlantis. Well, Plato said that that's what the Temple of Poseidon was like in Atlantis. That there were these two pillars, and I think one was made of bronze and the other was made of stone. The idea was that um, they would survive whatever kind of cataclysm might happen, whether it was fire or flood. And uh, that in within these pillars, or inscribed upon them, somehow was preserved, you know, the the key to the the science and the wisdom of their civilization. Mm. And then, you know, later on you have um, the story of the Temple of Solomon in the Bible. Again, you have the two pillars, Joaquin and Boaz. Um, and then, yeah, then you find the symbol of the Temple of Solomon and the pillars being used by occult groups, including Freemasons. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I and mean, where, where they sometimes they go further and they say, oh well, you know, the, the pillars represent these kind of uh, basic ideas in in uh, in life, in reality. You know that that you know, there's like mercy and severity, uh, the, the hard and the soft somehow. You know, <laughs> and uh, so you know, yeah, it's kind of a symbolism, a symbol of uh, dualism, dualistic ideas, I guess. Um, and as far as the connection with the dollar, it's interesting that uh, yeah, the one of the Theories, I guess, or things that's said in history books about where the the dollar, one dollar uh, symbol came from. The, I mean, the the dollar sign with the the S, and you know, mo nowadays people usually write it just with one line going through it. But um, it used to be much more common to, to two lines going through it. And so one of the origins, supposedly, of this is these silver dollars that used to circulate in the colonies before it was the United States. They were, um, they were actually Spanish reals that were being minted uh, in Mexico. And then they would um, make their way up to the colonists and they would just trade them around and use them as money. Uh, and they were called, they called them pillar dollars because they had these two pillars on them. Uh, it would, because it was the seal of the, um, House of Bourbon at the time, and uh, and they, you know, they had the seal that was basically, it says, it has a banner on it, or there's a, like a banner on each one of the pillars, it, and yeah, they're supposed to represent the pillars of Hercules. It's supposed to represent the um, gateway to the new world, you know, and of course the Spaniards were, uh, you know, do, doing business down in uh Mexico and South America. So uh, they, at the time, they were they were experiencing a sort of renaissance in their own economy. They were getting you know so much gold and silver from uh, the New World and bringing it back over. Um, and so they started, you know, th this idea that uh, that the New World was like this. This place where anything is possible, I think, is mm -hmm. uh, what was what was being represented here. So the words plus ultra mean mean there is more beyond. So it's like there is more beyond the pillars of Hercules. There's more, you know, of anything you can imagine in the new world. And so yeah, it was this idea of a new vista and a new re new possibilities opening up. And uh, of course, you, you know, the pillars of Hercules, I believe, um, come into play in the story of Atlantis too. Uh, I think that that's kind of where the, um, you know, Plato said that uh, the islands kind of sank in front of that. And uh, at any rate, um, so the, the, my point is just that uh, the, the dollar symbol supposedly comes from this, where uh, people, people say that uh, in order to symbolize the uh, two pillars with the banners wrapped around them that were on the back of these coins, people would draw the S with the two slashes going through it. So that's a story of it. I think it's uh, actually much more interesting, though, the, the actual origin of this symbol, because I think it's more about a symbol of a crucified serpent. Yeah, a lot of people uh, associate, 
Huh? Go ahead. A lot, a lot of people associate with the with DNA sign as well. There's that going around. Um, okay. Uh, have you ever come across anything that's convinced you in that that area? Uh, no, no, because I, the dollar symbol uh, is much older than anyone having seen DNA. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but no, I think um, I think it's alchemical. Uh, Unless the, you get into the alien side of it, and that's when they. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I don't think we need to do uh, that. Either. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we, you can you can go there if you want to. I, I since I can't see any aliens or prove they yeah. exist. I, no, I, that, that's that's fair. Enough. Well, it, it's kind of brings you onto a question because you've you've talked about angels and that kind of stuff. So, what what's your philosophy on on the angels? Obviously, obviously you don't think the a angels are aliens, but um, what, well, I don't what, know. They may be. I don't know. Uh, um, that's why I use the word a angel, basically, because yeah, right. You know, that's what it says um, yeah. in the Bible. So, and and you know, it accurately describes them, I guess, as messengers of something yeah. from beyond. Uh, but you know, as far as where are the watchers coming from? You're asking me. I mean, I think that it's easier for me to just imagine that the whole universe is so much more complicated. I mean, once you start believing in supernatural stuff, yeah, you know, uh, or or th opening your mind to that possibility, mm -hmm. then you know, there's nothing's off the table anymore, and you don't have to have someone on another planet traveling here in a spaceship, really. Although that could happen too. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, what do you do? You even know that there aren't um, like beings on Mars right now. Yeah, no, we that don't. Maybe are. Martian in some way in that you know they're martial like they're yeah. of the energy of Mars yeah. like what if when you do an invocation to Mars you're contacting these things you know um, I guess I'm, I'm saying they're like they're there usually tends to be like two points of views on this stuff when it comes to who are the angels the watchers the gods that the ancients used to talk about and it usually comes down to, you know, do you believe the kind of Von Daniken ancient aliens theory, which is tends to be a kind of rationalist theory, I think. It's like we want to make some sense of this, scientific sense. So here's what physically happened in reality and just somehow the evidence has been covered up. You know, we, we, uh, we forgot our history and we didn't, we didn't remember that there were these advanced beings from some other planet that came here and civilized – humans and built all these ancient monuments and stuff, which is all, you know, that, that makes sense really. And I, uh, have bought into that in the past and maybe, you know, yeah. still consider it a possibility, but there's this other level to it that I can't ignore because I have some experience with it. And so many other people say this is true, you know, that it, it's not just that ancient man thought that these things were gods because they had spaceships. Yeah. They actually were, you know, they're telling the truth that there's a, a supernatural event happening. That there's these entities, these intelligences, you can contact them, you can work with them somehow. Uh, which is, you know, there's still lots of people who yeah. do that today or claim that they can. Uh, and they're looking at it in a totally different way, you know. Um, usually they they see it as somehow metaphysical. These realms that these beings come from are not in physical reality. They contact them through meditation and rituals, uh, and so it's a, it, and a lot of people rationalize that even and say, well, it's really something going on in your head, and it's really your you know you're working with your own energies, and um, yeah, I kind of I don't believe either either camp necessarily. I think that uh, you know I'm just willing to kind of take the text at face value in a way. Yeah. In that they're saying that they can, you know, th there have been these interactions between humans and non-human supernatural entities for since the beginning. You know, maybe they created us. Maybe they created the whole universe that we're in somehow. Uh, or they know who did. And, um, you know, so I find it much more interesting, I think, to come from that angle, to, to not try to reduce everything down to something that we can explain with the – scientific tools and terms that we have now i don't think yeah. we have what it, i don't think we are in any better equipped than the ancients were really to try to explain this stuff yeah um but at any rate so that that's where i come down on that and that's kind of why i think you still have secret societies that are influential running the show 
it's made up of people who have the same perspective, or at least at the top, you find people that are literally in contact with these beings. And I think that if people would start taking that a little more seriously, their whole perspective on how the, you know, the elite are controlling society, what they're doing, what their goal is, is I'm not saying you're going to figure it out, but you're going to have a broader perspective. You're going to understand it better. I think yeah. when you realize that they really are, you know, there, there really are people who are doing occult stuff, contacting yeah. um, supernatural entities. Yeah. With well, yeah, it's, it's not seen as realistic in our society. Is it so, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. It needs to be understood that that kind of stuff is real. And then once it's accepted as a reality, then it can be judged accordingly, you know. Well, yeah. even if you don't want to believe that it's real. I mean, you know, I, can, I can't convince people of something if they can't see it. But, yeah. you know, at least to understand that this is what the people who are running the show might think. And, and then you understand things from their perspective a little bit better, I think. And but yeah, people still don't want to believe it, you know. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I I don't know. I, I I was the same way. But what I basically tried to do uh, years ago is I just tried it myself, you know, um, mm. contacting entities, and it worked really yeah. well, and it gave me a totally different perspective. So um, you know, there's some people that don't want to do that stuff, or they can't open themselves up to it. That's fine. I understand. Yeah. So, um, D David, have you got anything you'd like to add? Well, I must admit, I found myself warming to Tracy as this talk has progressed. Um, I was under the impression, I've not known your work for too long, Tracy, do forgive me. I oh, was sure. under the impression I was talking to a diehard conspiracy theorist. I'm no conspiracy theorist, and I have huge problems with a great deal of the absolute tosh they speak. Okay. Um I would like to ask you one thing. Um, esotericism, would you say you're a practicing esotericist, and what's the relationship between that and simply ordinary tradition? Well, what's the difference? Um... I mean, in Europe, we're up to our proverbial in tradition, you know, and I've noticed a lot of our American visitors see it as esoteric when, quite frankly, it simply isn't. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's, and it's basically that is just the fact that, yeah, Americans, you know, by and large, grew up influenced by Protestantism. And then this other stuff, you know, we have so many, like, uh, homegrown church movements here, yep. you know, um, so that you can grow up Christian and never know, like, the whole host of symbols, for instance, that Catholics use. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, it, it took me a long time to catch up to a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Just because I, I grew up here and I wasn't Catholic. And yeah. uh, then, you know, if you didn't grow up with your daddy being a Freemason, yeah. um, you know, all that stuff's going to be um, foreign to you. And then, you know, you get online and, and there's all these websites telling you <laughs> what it means. And every time there's a triangle, it means the Illuminati. The Illuminati thing is so annoying <laughs> because <laughs> people argue whether there is one or not. And, of course, there yeah. was one. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, and, and I think here's a key thing to understand about that i'm sure you know this but uh the illuminati yes was set up as a uh, subversive group mm -hmm. to to infiltrate masonic lodges that already existed and then there were other freemasons that were aware of this happening in their own movement in their system and they were annoyed by that and scared of it and trying to avoid it and it was this internal war that was happening and i don't think there was ever a point really at which the illuminati just took over the whole <laughs> every single lodge of Freemasonry, and it just became the Illuminati. But now it's like any kind of what, yeah, whatever people think is esoteric symbolism mm -hmm. uh, is called Illuminati now <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. by people who have never, I guess, been inside a Catholic church. So well, I, I, is that what you're talking about? I, that's exactly it. I think you're wonderful. This is a breath, breath of fresh air. I wasn't expecting this at all. Um, okay, good. Can you shed, I mean, I think you've got a very interesting take. I've been looking at your work over the last couple of days. And of course, um, free-minded settlers weren't the only colonists in America. I mean, one of the original ideas was to set up a theocracy. Do you think that maintains a superstitious view? That tension in your society maintain, maintains uh, a superstitious view regarding the supernatural, regarding the esoteric. What's, what's your view on that? 
Well, yeah. And again, it's it's what I was talking about. The fact that, um, you know, yeah, there were so there were already these kind of um what would you call austere uh movements yeah. of christianity uh yeah. that so many of the, the colonists belonged to in the beginning yeah like puritanism protest uh, and uh what was the other one the, uh, whatever the pilgrims were yeah. <laughs> um but uh and then there you had so many others that sprang up and continue to spring up mm-hmm. and uh it is kind of i don't know i grew up in in a nazarene household in a, in a way. I mean, my grandfather was a, a, um, a very influential minister in the Nazarene church. So mm-hmm. I, uh, you know, I come from this in a way too. Like we, you know, we know that somehow we came from the Catholic church and then we broke away. Mm-hmm. And there's this belief that somehow it's because the Catholic church was too ritually, you know, yeah. they did, they, yeah. Uh, they bordered on the edge of worshiping statues and uh, <laughs> they just, um, they, they're way too much into the ritual and uh, not enough into, uh, you know, personal relationship with God. So, uh, and then you've got, you know, I'm speaking very broadly, but I think yeah. that this is my, my, this tends to be my perspective on so many Protestant movements and other uh, just breakaway Christian movements is they seem to just be kind of conflicted. Like, they don't know what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to worship God, but almost every aspect of how a person would worship God, they've been told is somehow a gateway to evil. And so they don't know what to do, what they're supposed to be doing, and they're constantly being told every single week that they need to be reborn (laughs) and start over all over again because they're still sinful, they're still bad, and uh, and, and, and it's usually like something that they can't even – uh, quantify it. It's like mm-hmm. you're not loving God enough in the right way. You <laughs> need to be reborn so you can really get there, you know. Yes. And yeah. and yeah. no one can explain what this is, but they always feel bad. And uh, this is what I observe anyway. And it, I think with the Catholics, you know, at least uh, at least they have confession. You know, they can feel clean at the end of that. Yeah. And uh, and as far as the rituals go, I mean, it, you, you know, it is weird, like that they are. Um, you know, it seems to me like they're worshiping statues, you know, and it, and it kind of says to not do that in the Bible. But yeah. uh, <laughs> but I don't know. They've been doing that forever. This is the the, the yeah. Christian church, you know, I think, or at least one of them, one of the uh, main origins of all the traditions, yeah. which yeah. many of them are still being continued by the Protestants, like, you know, doing it on Sunday instead of Saturday, doing yeah. the, the Sabbath. And so I, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're conflicted. That's all I can say. But I'll let you uh, chime in here. Go ahead. Oh, I think you're wonderful. I do hope you'll grace us with your presence again at some point. Um, I, yeah. I've got to ask one last personal thing to ask, I suppose. Um, you say you've practiced occultism. What type of occultism did you practice? And, um, and if you still do. And one weirdo question from me. Have you ever looked at sort of the hollow earth mythos? And what do you think of that? Well, okay. Um, normally, you know, a reason, for a long time, I haven't talked about this stuff. Mm. Um, I'm coming out with a new book soon where I will kind of get into a little bit of my own personal experiences. So therefore, I've decided, you know, I can talk about it a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically, I, you know, spent years reading about occultism, mm. uh, ritual magic, secret societies. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, I, okay, when I was 18 years old, I started this magazine. It was a zine at the time. It was like something I, I printed on uh, Xerox paper mm-hmm. uh, called Dagobert's Revenge. And I oh. kind of – I felt like I was inspired by this thing. Like I was tapped by something out, from outside my own mind to do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And from that point on, I kind of formed a relationship with this thing. I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. I, call, I thought it was the grail. Mm. Uh, long, I, I'll try to shorten this story. But basically it was like I, I – um, Ended up forming a group called mm. Ordo Laps at Exilus with some of the other people who were running that magazine with me. Mm-hmm. And then eventually we ended up doing some stuff. It started off with actually just a Ouija board seance to mm. uh, Jean Cocteau, the artist. Mm. And then we ended up getting in contact with all sorts of entities. Mm. And then the entities started actually teaching us. First of all, they told us all sorts of interesting stuff about history that was very little known at the time and we were able to verify 
Uh, and then um, they told us they started teaching us how to do magic. And uh, so, you know, I won't go into too many details here. I know we're almost out of time, but basically, uh, you know, I learned from I didn't join someone else's group. Um, yeah. Later, I was uh, later I got incorporated into this thing called the Dragon Court, which is kind of hard to explain, but uh, <laughs> maybe later. Um, which is, uh, but I would say that was in a way it was a real uh, magical group, and it um, that also gave me some experience. But anyway, uh, but the really interesting thing for me was yeah, learning uh, what I would call uh, secret the secrets of magic from. Yeah. The source, really. <laughs> so uh, that's what happened. And uh, yes, it sort of is still happening. But I'll have to fill you in more on, about that uh, later, I guess. Oh, incredible. Yeah, that would be that would be really good if you come on when, you, when you've when you released that book to have a good chat about that. That sounds like a really interesting conversation, that. Okay, sure. And be yeah. fast, as I say, Hollow Earth thoughts, because one of our other guests is going to talk about that. And I, I have such a regard for you. I wonder if you've got any personal perspective to shed on that well i think it's true and i just haven't figured out on what level yet is i i mean physically true i'm not sure i mean i don't know if you'll find it if you yeah. drill <laughs> deep enough but um as far as i think that it basically it represents the underworld you know it's the it's yeah. a realm that is somehow beneath our own uh and i think that this is you know all all societies have talked about this idea yeah. And that there's entities living down there, and we did talk to some of them, and they describe themselves as being in prison, which is exactly what the myths talk about. They talk about fallen angels being imprisoned in uh, hell, you know, and it's actually described as yeah. being in the bowels of the earth. And then there's this esoteric concept of uh, a hidden sun in the center of the earth that is not just, um, you know, wasn't just talked about by Nazis and not just yeah. uh, by yeah. uh, weird Eastern cults, but also, like, you find it in uh, the Rosicrucians. They talk about how Christian Rosenkreutz was buried in this tomb that's in the center of the earth, and it's lit by an, uh, uh, a hidden sun somehow. So, I don't know. I think it's uh, it means something esoterically, and it may actually be a realm that you can visit um, yeah. astrally, you know, and it may, it may be something more. I don't know. Oh. But as far as, you know, do I think that, like, the laws yeah. of physics are different than what they teach us? I mean, yeah. I don't have any evidence for that. Yeah, mm. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense to me. And that you can get, go into Lord of the Rings and that kind of stuff for, for that as well. You know, it's, it's the symbology is all in but, there. But, you know, every time I, like, this, the missing airplane, every time something like that happens, I think about this, you know. Mm, and yeah, Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle and all that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I don't I don't discount anything, um, but yeah, I don't really get into those the details of those theories too much. Okay. One last question: What was Jesse Ventura like? <laughs> well, I mean, he's pretty much what Jesse Ventura is like, you know. Right. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say, but it's like you know, he's what you would expect. Right. He was okay. cool. He was cool. I enjoyed cool. meeting him. Good. Good. All right. Then <laughs> we'll, 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 we we um, really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been really enjoyable. Um, right. as, as I said, it'd be great to have, have you on again at some point when you when you release another book. That'll be that'll be really good to um, go into that. Yeah. Hey, um, sorry about the scheduling uh, conflict. I'll oh, that's 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 time. okay. It's um, it's probably our fault to be honest. I'm I'm a bit lazy with getting working all the hours out and stuff. Okay. There you go. I'll, I'll get there. Okay. Well, thanks again, Tracy, and uh, we'll we'll hopefully speak to you soon. Sure. Nice talking to you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Okay, that's a wrap. Um, I think you asked some really good questions there, David. Oh, I think we both did, my friend. I mean, I was completely won over by her. She's intelligent. She's humorous. I love her work. And, and uh, oh, my God, it's a good job I'm spoken for. Otherwise, I think I'd have fallen in love. Yeah, what well, a wonderfully interesting woman. Yeah, well, it was refreshing that she's she's basically indulging in a lot of very relevant esoteric stuff, but isn't yeah. isn't coming across as pointing the finger at, at, at a certain group, which I think there's, yeah. there's too much of that going on. Um, so it was, it was you the other day, my friend. You know, we, we've got to look at you know accentuate the positive. We've got to find out the good. We've got mm -hmm. to point out the good and not keep accusing each other of all these terrible things and let, yeah. let the truth be out and all that. Sort yeah. Of stuff. 
as you, as you said uh, before, basically just attack those who you can see doing wrong rather than the who you think are doing wrong. Yeah. Exactly. Paul, you've had another masterly show. I congratulate you. Well, it's our it's our show, mate. It's our show, you know. Yeah, and uh, if people don't support us by shedding links and linking up with our other people, I will personally visit them with all of my mafia chums and let's talk some turkey. Do it. Do yeah. it, listeners, or else. Oh, and I'll be right there with you, mate. I'll be right there with you. You, you hear, listeners? You don't want to not link this stuff of us. You're going to be in big trouble, all right? Quality stuff, listeners. Do us a turn. Do us a favour. Yep. You will be rewarded. That's all I'll say. Advice and indeed on earth. Yeah. Okay. In a way, our next guest is Anthony Peak. We'll be talking to Anthony Anthony Peak about quantum physics and lots of really, really mind blowing stuff. Are you going to be ready for that one, David? I'm ready and I'm able. Let's talk turkey. Oh, I love it. I love his work. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Yeah. Um, so, people, until then, see you later, sausages. Bye, bye. Bye.